Hello everyone and welcome to Government 340 Central Asian Politics. I'm very excited to have you all in my class this summer. Um, I know it's not exactly how we anticipated the summer session going, but we're going to try um, our best to make sure that this semester is a great one for everyone. Today is a shorter PowerPoint that focuses on providing an introduction to Central Asia. First and foremost, it is necessary for us to determine where exactly Central Asia is. The region is commonly defined as the five major Central Asian republics being Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan. Although sometimes Afghanistan is also included uh, in this grouping. As shown by the middle image on this PowerPoint slide, um, UNESCO actually includes a much wider area. So this includes not only Afghanistan, but parts of Pakistan, Iran, India, much of Western China and Mongolia. Um, and the titular um, I ethnic identities that we're used to seeing as the major republic identities were only created um, in the 1930s. Uh, when they were given that status and by the uh, by the Soviet Union prior to this point um, while these groups did exist in the region they were hardly the only or major groups in the areas where they were um, where they were eventually given their leadership and this was largely done by the Soviet Union in order to undercut various nationalist movements within Central Asia Prior to the Soviets' reorganization of Central Asia, there was a major republic um, known as Turkestan uh, that referred not necessarily to any singular ethnic identity within the region, but instead related back to the linguistic group that uh, predominates in Central Asia. All of the major groups in the area speak a Turkic language with the exception of Tajikistan, which speaks an offshoot of Persian. For the purposes of this class, when we use the term Central Asia, we will be using the common understanding of the region. So once again, this is Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan. We will also be dealing with Afghanistan due to its importance to the United States and also due to its importance in the development of the region during the Soviet period. Um, so while it is not commonly conceived as being an official part of Central Asia, it is still a particularly interesting state that impacts the region um, and its political developments to this day. Although a lot of the readings that we look at will not be covering Afghani political developments quite as closely as they will be following the other countries of Central Asia. To make up for this imbalance, at least in part, we will have a week that is solely devoted to Afghani politics and um, the political developments, both international and domestic in Afghanistan. And we will also be having a group that is specifically following Afghanistan. So we'll at least be getting a little bit of the news uh, every class. Now that we've gone over where Central Asia is, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about what is Central Asia. Now, the Diener and Megoran piece deals a lot with this. One of the first things that they hit on is the fact that Central Asia sits at the dividing line between Europe and Asia. And of all the continents, the divide between Europe and Asia is perhaps the least distinct. Um, and because of this, their second point kind of runs into this one, where Central Asia is also a site of a great deal of trade, of the movement of people. And this is what we see a lot of authors coming back to time and time again. This is a region that sees a lot of fluctuation, both in those who are living in it, those who are not living in it, those who've moved in, those who've moved out, um, who's in charge of the region, who was in charge of the region. There's an incredible amount of variation seen throughout Central Asia over time um, and where people live um, where they work where 
their grandchildren live, all of this can change rather rapidly. And this isn't because, as a lot of stereotypes will tell you, that the region is full of uh, people who are nomadic. A large proportion of those living in Central Asia are actually sedentary. Um, a large number of the nomads are actually from a region that overlaps with areas of Kazakhstan called the Eurasian Steppe, but this is hardly limited to Central Asia. Um, the steppe begins in, uh, in eastern Mongolia and stretches all the way to the Donbass in Ukraine. Um, so this is a really large area saw a plethora of various nomadic groups gaining uh, prominence over time. And oftentimes when nomadic groups were pushed out, they'd move into this area due to both within group movement and the fluctuations in various nomadic groups that were living to the north and east of the region, and also with various imperial powers, both China and Russia and the British Empire at one point all had interest in controlling the trade routes that ran over land in Central Asia, um, meant that this region was highly interconnected uh, with, the, with Europe and and Asia, both economically and politically, um, which served to make this region incredibly diverse and very rich, uh, both in its cultural developments uh, and in its political ones. Due to the centrality of the location of Central Asia, we also see it being a site of a high degree of geostrategic competition. Now, uh, Dinar and Megoran first talk about how this was primarily fought between the Russian Empire and the British Empire. The British Empire expanding its colonial holdings north from India and the Russian Empire expanding east and south. Um, and these two groups were engaged in what is termed as a colonial cold war with one another. But in the modern era, we see a much more complicated um, international game, if you want to call it, being played over the region. Um, you have the these states being functional, independent international actors now, um, where they didn't have that degree of external legitimacy vis-a-vis -vis empire. So they're in a much stronger negotiating uh, position. You have China who's interested in re-establishing the Silk Road with their One Belt, One Road policy. You have um, the Russian Federation very much still seeing these states as part of its uh, near abroad of part of its periphery and sphere of influence. You have the United States who's interested particularly in flyover zones over Kyrgyzstan uh, to move troops in and out of Afghanistan. Um, you have Turkey with linguistic and ethnic ties to many groups in the region. And jumping back in history just a little bit, we're going to talk about specifically the Russian experience with Central Asia. Russia, at the time being a small collection of um, principalities located in Eastern Europe of Kievan Rus and Muscovy, was conquered by the Mongol Empire. So while the Mongol Empire harried a lot of uh, European powers over its tenure, it actually conquered uh, what would later become Russia. And this period, which the Russians uh, dubbed the Mongol yoke, has a great deal of cultural influence uh, on Russia still to this day, um, where it is very much a, a time of remembered subjugation that influences how uh, Russians at the time see saw the world, um, and often how uh, many Russian politicians choose to frame uh, potential in, uh, incursions onto Russian territories through this lens of, we were once subjugated and it cannot happen again. Um, so this time period is greatly remembered um, and still referred back to after 
Kivanrus and Muscovy had shook off this Mongol yoke and ha- and the Golden Horde had largely collapsed due to internal issues. Uh, various Russian czars moved on to conquer various khanates located uh, around the Black Sea and in the North Caucasus. And later, centuries after Mongol rule ended, they turned their attention to Central Asia, moving in uh, to very slowly uh, conquer uh, Central Asia. Their actual control over politics is highly suspect for a lot of this period, uh, really only solidifying with the inclusion of railroads uh, through the region. Um, But nonetheless, they managed to make the region um, their own uh, through various vassal leaderships, and uh, they held on to this region up until the 1917 Russian Revolution, um, at which point you saw these regions break away um, as Russia's hold on them had been tenuous to begin with. Uh, the collapse of the authority of the Russian czars and the government of Russia meant that they um, essentially had self-governance for a short period of time up until the Soviet Union re-established control. Um, The Soviet Union had to conduct similar projects in the Far East and especially in the North and South Caucasus um, and even in parts of Eastern Europe, um, though they later lost these during World War II, only to regain them later. So this process of reconquest also included a policy of reorganization um, where they took how the groups were self-organizing and kind of reshuffled things a little bit. Um, And this undercut a lot of the groups that had been engaged in self-rule, not to mention that during Stalin's purges in the 1930s, a lot of the upper echelons of the various Bolshevik party movements in Central Asia were were killed or deported. Um, a lot of the Soviet policies, while they did create these titular ethnicities and promoted a policy of indigenization and gave a great deal of autonomy to various uh, ethnic and national leaders, they reshuffled the actual political organization of the region to such a degree that they undercut a lot of the early independence movements or potential independence movements coming out of uh, Central Asia. Um, Another thing that you saw them doing was moving in a large number of Russians. So even to this day, Kazakhstan is about 30% ethnically Russian. Um, And so this policy was seen not only in Central Asia, but also in the Baltics and in Eastern Ukraine. Um, And these have very clear political uh, implications on modern day life and in how these various new states, new, um, relatively speaking, uh, behave vis-a-vis Russia. Lastly, what we will be discussing is who is Central Asia. And to look at this, um, we can largely refer back to the Morgan Liu reading, Central Asia is Local. Much like Liu did in his piece, we will also be looking at common stereotypes held of the Central Asian region. So firstly, a lot of people assume that the region is isolated, and we've hit on this already, um, where the region is really anything but isolated, um, in either as a site of trade or as a site of geopolitics or um, as an international powerhouse in its own right. This region has always been very interconnected. Another stereotype is that the region is homogenous. Um, But once again, the region is incredibly ethnically and culturally diverse instead of being homogenous. Um, So while there are various titular ethnic identities of the republics, they are comprised of numerous ethnic minority communities. Um, The ethnic communities are not solely held within the borders of the very republics that bear their name. Um, This region has seen an incredible amount of migration of people and ideas as well. Um, So it is a highly complex and highly diverse region um, that cannot really be described as homogenous. 
A third and fourth stereotype really go hand in hand. That this region is exotic and traditional. Um, and while some aspects of the region might be foreign, um, if you are from a different region like the United States, um, but the term exotic is often loaded with a, um, a degree of ethnocentrism, and the term uh, carries a connotation of a degree of dehumanization. Additionally, a lot of the traditional aspects of this of society are more complicated than they may initially appear. Um, some aspects of tradition are readily practiced. Um, but even if something looks traditional on the surface, in a lot of cases, if not all cases, it is the product of an intense amount of cultural layering. One example where this term exotic and traditional might intersect is when looking at uh, muhalas. So these are traditional living uh, quarters uh, where they're a residential quarter, narrow streets, they're typically handmade houses, most of them have courtyards, families grow their own crops, and there are very thick community ties uh, in these in these areas where most people know everyone else they've been they know each other's children they know each other's grandparents the same people have lived with one another their families have lived close to one another for uh generations if not longer and these communities often have regular group gatherings and um oftentimes like they will know each other for uh for their entire lives. And to a, someone who's not from the region, this may seem like a practice that is exotic. Despite this, those types of communities are the norm for human relations across the world. Um, similar dynamics are even seen in small towns in the United States, where you might not have like these homemade households, but you definitely have small towns where everyone knows each other and their children and their grandparents. Um, perhaps they've lived in the same town for three to four generations of family. Uh, and so we see this in a lot of places and even though those communities are traditional you do also see people moving away from those areas but even today they're able to keep ties with those um that they've left and they might leave because they don't agree with the traditions that they've practiced but they might also leave for greater opportunities um and so what's really important to keep in mind here is that the reality is always more complicated than the stereotypes will portray. Looking at moving forward with the course to one thing to keep in mind with re when reading the textbook provided for this course is that we have a variety of authors who specialize in different areas of study. So some of the things we read will be written by political scientists. Um, George Mason's own uh, Dr. Eric McGlinchey uh, has written uh, uh, an article that we will be reading later on. Um, but there are also others. So there's sociologists and ethnographers um, and historians, and all of them will provide a differing perspective on the same place. Um, and you can see this very clearly in the uh, in the readings that we had today. So the first one that we were looking at um, uh, being the Jenner Morgan piece is more of a historical and political account, whereas uh, whereas Lou's piece is very much uh, an ethnography, looking very intensely at the local um, individual experience of living in Central Asia, and this view of the microscopic life of the individual life is very important to keep in mind as we move forward with some of the greater uh not necessarily greater uh, but bigger political movements that we see throughout the region another thing that we're going to see time and time again over the course of this of this class is the idea of constructed identities. So while we might think it easier to consider people and peoples as singular things that are carved into stone, very often we see the identity um, that individuals prescribe to to be something that is in great flux across time. So 
Many of the Central Asian republics, for example, are practice Islam. But during the Soviet period, you have very few observances um, or very few people observing Islam. Um, but there was a great revival once the Soviet Union collapsed. The region remained Central Asia, but the degree to which those within the region identified as Muslim varied across time. And so very oftentimes when we're dealing with uh, internal conflicts or interstate wars or even interstate ones that happen between various republics, um, or even just ethnic identities writ large, people will and leaders will attempt to prescribe some sort of primordial identity. Uh, but it's important to keep in mind that who people are and who they identify as is something that changes across time and is very much dependent on the nature of state society relations um, at a given time. Finally, keep in mind that while we may hold our own stereotypes to, um, and attempt through this class to very much dispel those stereotypes, uh, that those within the region also hold stereotypes about one another. Um, looking at the nomadic sedentary divide within Central Asia, those who are nomadic are perceived one way, those who are sedentary are perceived another. Um, and this is despite the fact that there haven't been a lot of nomadic groups in the region since the beginning of the Soviet era when a lot of groups were forced to become sedentary by the Soviet leadership. Um, so somehow they, a, a descendant of nomads is, most, is supposed to have a more fiery temper than someone who, who is the descendant of a sedentary population. Um, and this very much relates back to the idea of primordial identities, um, that somehow being from a nomadic ethnic identity means that you still carry those traits despite the societal changes. Um, is something that very much relates back to a primordial ethnic identity, when in reality, the idea behind those differences is in itself very much constructed and based off of stereotypes of past um, beliefs about those very groups that have carried on uh, to the present day. Taken together, uh, Central Asia is a collection of five independent republics uh, located in uh, in between Russia, India, Iran, and China. Um, our course will be looking primarily at Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan, uh, but we will also be covering uh, Afghanistan from time to time um, and making sure to rope that in with the rest of them. Um, and moving forward, keep in mind that this is a highly diverse, very complex region, um, and we're devoting the next eight weeks to develop an introduction. Introductory understanding of the region.